Thank you for joining me. I want to talk today about Robert Nozick's views on distributive justice. He famously endorses the entitlement theory of distributive justice and has become the most well-known proponent of, more generally, historical approaches to distributive justice. For starters, uh, Nozick advocates what is typically in the literature called the entitlement view and sometimes the historical principles view. And on this view, there are two principles for the distribution of resources in any society. The first principle is that all holdings of goods or resources must have been acquired in accordance with appropriate justice. And the second principle is that all transfers of resources or holdings must be done in accordance with the principles of justice. Okay, and he adds a third principle saying that no other kind of distribution of resources is just that doesn't invoke these two principles. Now, this is very famous because it is a simple, easy to understand, historical approach to distributive justice. Nozick does not advocate some sort of centralized distribution, like someone such as John Rawls does, in thinking about how the resources and goods of society ought to be divided up. Instead, he thinks that individuals, persons, need to be empowered to be free in their choices. Nozick favors the maximization of freedom over and against equality as a competing value. And he thinks that his entitlement view, with its historical emphasis and its assertion that justice is possible if and when the principles of justice in acquisition and transfer are fulfilled, is a view that has come to be associated very closely with the libertarian political movement. Now I want to say a couple more things about Nozick's views on distributive justice because although deceptively simple they are actually very profound and have far-reaching implications. One thing that I want to emphasize is that for Nozick there is no one who does the distribution for everyone. No government, no uh, central body ought to do distributions of resources or goods for everyone. Instead, uh, Nozick would prefer a society in which each individual is given the ability to make the distribution that he or she pleases. The second comment that I want to make is that Nozick very intentionally wants to ground distributive principles not in the current state of affairs but rather in past states of affairs including especially the choices that people have made. Nozick is really big on consent in the distribution of resources as being the key to justice. If someone chooses to labor with his hands and acquire certain natural resources, or if someone chooses to transfer what he has to someone else in return for what the other has, then that is justice that is being done. Okay, and so for Nozick, uh, the individual chooser is the locus of justice in ascertaining the justice of acquisition and transfer in holdings. Now, I want to say a couple of uh, critical things about just, about Nozick, uh, but first one more comment about history. Nozick is very self-conscious of the fact that his is a historical view of the distribution of justice, and he intentionally tries to eschew any sort of current assessment of the holdings of persons and how equal those holdings are. I'm going to criticize that momentarily, but I want to emphasize that. Now for two criticisms of Nozick's entitlement view of justice. Uh, one, uh, quite well known, and Nozick himself seems to be aware of it, although in Anarchy, State, and Utopia he uh, famously dispenses with it with kind of a wave of the hand. One criticism is that Nozick 
does not offer us adequate principles of historical redress for crimes in the development of the current holdings that exists now. Let me make this concrete by offering you an example. Presumably on Nozick's view, if you acquire land or transfer land in a way that is just, then you are the just holder of the land. But what if you inherit land from others who inherited land, from others who inherited land, from others who acquired land unjustly. For instance, I was raised in central Texas and prior, long prior to me, the process by means of which land holdings in central Texas today exist was brought about. So approximately in the early 1800s, the uh, European settlers, primarily European, coming from the eastern United States encountered land that was claimed by the Mexican government. Mexican government in most cases gave uh, just uh, entitlements through legal means, uh, grants to land grants to the settlers coming in from the eastern United States. And those settlers came to be the original possessors of the land in central Texas where I grew up. But where did the Mexican government acquire the right to give land grants to the European settlers? And in some cases, those European settlers actually didn't receive land grants from the Mexican government. They simply squatted on the land, seized it, and claimed it as their own. But where did the European settlers and the Mexican government obtain the right to the land? Well, in most cases, they simply claimed it. They seized it from Comanche uh, Native American tribes who preceded them. And so one might argue that true justice would require returning these land holdings to those who originally possessed them, since seizure of land against the consent of the Comanche Native American tribes doesn't seem to be justice in holdings. But if you go further back in history, the Comanche tribes appear to have seized the land from previous tribes. The Apaches, the Chiricahua Apaches in my part of central Texas. And prior to that, if you go even further back, the Apaches appear to have seized the land from other tribes, including the Kiowa and others. So really, if you dig into the history of holdings, it, you can do this not just for land, but for a variety of different things. If you dig into the history of holdings, it becomes very quickly a tangled mess. And the criticism of Nozick is that it really is not that simple just to say, let's come up with a principle of rectification in order to uh, ensure that previous holdings are dealt with in a just manner. Because it's, an, it's, a, it's a terrible mess when you actually go back in history and look at how holdings were acquired. Uh, some are acquired justly, others are not, and those who you think might have acquired them justly may have inherited them from others who did not acquire them justly. It's all, it's all a very difficult mess, and Nozick seems not to fully appreciate the gravity of the situation. The second uh, criticism that I want to level against Nozick's view of distributive justice is that Nozick seems to think that consent is something that can be just in all or almost all circumstances without coercion. And if anything has been shown to us by the last 40 or 50 years of the operation of governments and the operation of businesses in the West, it's pretty clear that there are a variety of ways in which powerful parties that have asymmetric power advantages over others can manage to get weaker parties to consent, in, by intellectual means freely consent, to contracts or to other transfers of holdings, when in fact, even though no physical coercion is involved, really in a variety of different ways they are, they are dramatically influencing the weaker party, so that the weaker party is all but uh, coerced.
And Nozick doesn't seem to fully appreciate the possibility of coercion, even in contracts that are formally free. Okay, so one example from business ethics might be the apparel factories that go into uh, countries in the developing world, like Central America, South America, uh, East Asia, and offer contracts for very low wages to the workers there. Are the workers there free to reject the contract? Yes. Formally, they are free. In practice, most of the time, they are not. If they want to continue living in the village or town where the factory will be located, the only jobs that will be available to them in short order will be those jobs that are provided by the apparel company building the factory on the apparel company's terms. And the local people, although formally free, are informally coerced. And in a variety of different ways, one could criticize Nozick for saying that uh, asserting that uh, free consent is the basis of justice in, uh, in, type, in his entitlement theory of distributive justice is highly simplistic and neglects all the ways in which psychological coercion is possible, even in spite of formal freedoms.